welcome then once again this is um as i said just then the, the kind of the second one in this series of monday conversations for our new research network arts of place and the the theme for this evening difficult paradises grew out of one of the features from our newsletter which is the seasonal crooks feature so in every issue of our newsletter we're going to be um, inviting one of our members to reflect on some issue that reaches to the crux of what's at stake when we think and write about place. What are the questions or challenges that, um, that shape the way we perceive the environment or our relationships with, with, with our surroundings? And um, we we're really fortunate to have Michael Malay contribute the first one of our seasonal crooks reflections. Um, so um, Michael is a lecturer in English and environmental humanities at the University of Bristol and um, his writing and thinking and his teaching as well is characterized by sensitive appreciation for and attentiveness to the smallest details in our surroundings. So Michael's first book, which is called The Figure of the Animal in Modern and Contemporary Poetry, um, puts this attentiveness into practice by thinking about ways in which close reading of poetry, um, how paying really sensitive attention to sound and rhyme and language, cultivates a special openness to animal life. Um, and his current book project, um, which is entitled Late Night, is, um, is taking this uh, one step further by thinking particularly about animals that are threatened with extinction. And one of the ways that Michael is thinking about these, um, these threatened animals is to, to kind of thinking about the, the complex conceptions of loss and hope. Um, and, and this is one <coughs> theme, this kind of interrelationship of loss and <coughs> of fragility that comes across in the article that he gave us for Place Notes, which is called Dereliction <coughs> and Healing Among Coal Spoils. And that piece um, has encouraged uh, me and, um, and, and um, lots, lots of us, I hope, to, um, to think again about what constitutes a healthy landscape. Um, so Michael's going to be our second speaker uh, this evening, but our first speaker is Liam Olds, who, um, with, with whom Michael went to uh, look at the uh, coal spoils in South Wales. Um, Liam is an entomologist and founder of uh, the Coal Spoil Biodiversity Initiative. Um, and if anyone's interested in, in, in finding that website, the, the website is in the chat uh, section to just have a look and follow that up afterwards. Um, but this initiative aims to raise awareness of the biological importance of coal spoil tips and to promote their conservation. Um, and Liam's got a special interest in, in, these, um, in these environments in South Wales, where he grew up where the industrial, cultural and environmental legacy of, of, of coal mining um, is, is, is such a prominent feature of the landscape. Um, Liam is uh, the author of Report into uh, Invertebrate Conservation Value of Colliery Spoils in South Wales. And he's also got a special interest in biological recording. So he's going to begin for us this evening our discussion of difficult paradises. So welcome to Liam. Oh, thanks very much, Jessica. Just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that okay. If suddenly you just put the thumbs up or something just to tell me that they can see it. Yeah, great stuff. Right, yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me along uh, this evening. As Jessica has already said, uh, my name is Liam Olds and I'm an entomologist based in South Wales and I run a conservation initiative called the Coleridge Well Biodiversity Initiative, which is all about raising awareness 
um, of colliery spoil habitats uh, for wildlife, um, particularly for invertebrates, which is my area um, of interest. And these are habitats are really close to my heart and I'm trying to campaign really for, for their protection. And in 10 minutes is not, not a huge amount that I can tell you, but I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a guided tour um, about kind of what makes these um, particularly important sites, some of the habitats you get on them and some of the issues surrounding their conservation as well. So the term colliery spawn might be a term that not all of you are familiar with, um, but effectively it's just the waste material that's been left over from coal extraction. So there's many regions of the British Isles, um, including South Wales, but also North Wales, Yorkshire, the central belt of Scotland and so forth, that have this really long history um, of deep coal mining. And during the coal extraction process, um, they had to get through lots of geological layers and a lot of these were, were waste rock um, that weren't actually needed. It was only the black gold is what they were after. So they tipped that material um, to form what we call spoil tips or coal tips um, on valley tops and valley sides. And these are really sort of iconic features within the landscape of the South Wales valleys. Um, and these tips can contain various things. Um, so various sedimentary rocks, uh, particularly shale, um, but also ironstone and other sedimentary rocks, various fragments of coal, uh, materials from demolished colliery buildings, things like concrete and bricks, uh, and also other waste materials like old dram casts that, that used to uh, pull the spoil um, up onto the valley tops. So you can almost look at them as sort of historic uh, dumping grounds. Um, and there's quite a number of these sites across South Wales. So there's an estimated 1,200 um, sites um, in South Wales alone. And then when you sort of combine all the other coal fields in the British Isles, they are Quite a, quite a dominant habitat type. And the vast majority of these sites were removed in the 1970s and um, 80s, but there was a, a lucky few that managed to survive um, and they've undergone this really incredible transformation from these sort of black uh, eyesores in the landscape to these really spectacular uh, wildlife habitats, which is uh, the reasoning behind obviously me speaking to you today. Um, but these are obviously man-made sites um, and I know this discussion tonight is around this, but you know, these are, these are man-made sites that, that in many people's eyes aren't viewed as being of any particular importance, but rather ironically, these are symbols of an industry that, that really devastated the landscape. But actually you now these are sort of beacons of hope, I suppose. These are sites that are supporting rare and scarce species. Um, and I think without them, we would be really lost, you know, and I, I just think there's such amazing places. And I'm just going to kind of show you just some of the habitats you get on these sites and how our value uh, or our opinion, sorry, of, of what is um, natural really kind of needs to be changed because these sites are actually support some of our largest extensive semi-natural habitat uh, within the South Wales Valleys. And you get these amazing wildflower rich grasslands. So this is probably a scene that many people won't really associate with coal tips or you know, man-made sites uh, as, a, as a whole, really. Um, so you've got this amazing display of, of, of grassland in the frontier, really flower rich, as you can imagine, really valuable for pollinating insects. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of these sites are a lot more flower rich than actual more natural habitats like wildflower meadows, of which we don't really have many left anyway. Uh, as well as these really important grasslands, you also get um, very nice heathland habitats as well, particularly on, on the tips that are situated on the valley tops at a uh, higher altitude. So they might be sort of 300, uh, 600 meters high, so quite, quite exposed. And this is where you get the nice sort of um, dry heathland uh, with bits of grassland in between as well. And they also have um, a very specialist habitat in their own right on, on a lot of these uh, heath covered tips in the fact that they have lichen heath habitats. This is where you get very open ground conditions and it allows these um, specialists sort of lichens uh, and also mosses and liverworts to thrive because they're not um, by grasses and other flora. So you get this lovely clumps of uh, cladonia lichen, the, the, white, the white stuff in the picture there is cladonia lichen and it really thrives uh, on these sites. You also get a variety of wetland habitats as well. So things like ponds, um, lakes, seasonal pools. Um, and as you can see here, you've got um, a beautiful display of cotton grass, which is a, a plant that you normally expect to find on uh, peatlands, on peat bog habitats. 
And this is where these sites have this amazing ability to replicate a lot of our natural habitats. And here is replicating what is um, a peat bog habitat, which is a really pristine, pristine and ancient habitat. So it shows you how incredible these sites can be. And in these really exceptional circumstances, you can get very large rebed systems as well, which has value for not just invertebrates, but also a variety um, of birds as well, things like water rail, uh, reed warbler, reed bunting, um, and so forth. Some of these sites can be quite wooded as well, but they, there's also sites that are almost really, um, treeless. So each site is unique in its own right, but where there is woodland, um, it can be rather beautiful and it's often uh, birch woodland, but it can also be oak woodland as well. And then you get bare ground as well, which is a habitat that's very overlooked and underappreciated really. And this is probably a site that people would perhaps associate with, with these colliery sites is this black exposed bare ground. Um, but I actually think this is quite a, quite a beautiful scene. And the bare ground is really important um, to habitat because it provides a nesting opportunity for things like solitary bees and solitary wasps. Uh, these are also areas where things like ground beetles and spiders and other sort of visual predators will hunt. Um, and also at their basking areas for things like reptiles um, such as adders and slow worms uh, and common lizards. So a really important habitat uh, that shouldn't be um, overruled. And I, my journey really on these sites kind of starts, well, really in my early teens, but in terms of a professional capacity, uh, I started researching sites back in 2015 as part of um, a traineeship scheme or apprenticeship um, based at the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. Um, we were kind of looking for a habitat that was sort of, look well, effectively a very iconic Welsh habitat. And looking at the old coal tips was seen as quite an interesting thing to look at. And very little was known about these sites because no one had really taken any real effort to look at them because they are man-made sites, they're brownfields, they won't be of any particular value. So I started to research them and actually found that they're actually amazing places. And really they should be some of our sites of sort of greatest conservation um, priority. And I was really lucky enough that at, once I finished my traineeship, I managed to found my conservation initiative and managed to get um, several years worth of funding from my, my home county of Rondekin and Taft, but also from a neighbouring um, county borough as well, of Neathport Talbot. So I've had some, some lovely support from local councils as well. But my initial research, unfortunately, I can't go into all of the species that I found, uh, otherwise you'd be here all day. But um, my initial research revealed over 900 species which um, is just like a baseline sort of start really. So I expect this figure to be perhaps three to five times higher, but it does sort of show that there's this quite incredible diversity on these sites, the sites that might only be, you know, 30, 40 years old, and they've gone from literally nothing to, to where they are today. Um, but perhaps most importantly, they've got this diversity, but it also includes some of our rarest and most threatened um, species within Britain as well. So around 20% of all the species um, that I found of invertebrates have been of conservation priority. So they've been localized, scarce, rare, um, or so forth. So it's really important as part of invertebrate conservation within, within Wales that we, we really um, sort of acknowledge these sites and really ensure that they're protected because very few of them are, uh, unfortunately. But it just some of the figures include sort of 28 butterfly species, um, over 90 species of bee, so that's about a, a third of the entire UK bee fauna or about half the Welsh fauna. Um, and also well over 20 species of millipede, which includes some of the world's rarest species as well. So there's definitely, um, definitely sites that are worthy of conservation in my opinion. Unfortunately, there are sites that are deemed as derelict wasteland, as eyesores, and sites are being lost on a continual basis. And this is the site that's opposite my house um, here. And this is the old Coidili Colliery site. And this is a site that was, that was responsible for me getting interested in wildlife and becoming interested in these colliery sites. And unfortunately, this site is being developed on and turning into an industrial estate. And this is kind of something that we're facing uh, on a continual basis of just local councils, uh, Welsh government just don't value the sites. And this is a problem that faces all brownfield sites, uh, all man-made sites across the, the whole of the UK. So regardless of how well nature has sort of recovered these sites or reclaimed these sites, there's still this pressure from, from local councils, from government, sometimes the public as well, 
do something useful with these sites and not doing something useful could be planting them with conifer trees it could be can, uh, planting them with broadleaf trees it could be um, removal completely uh, it could be building on them uh, so for housing or industrial estates uh, it could be using the spoil as an aggregate in the construction industry and, and the list almost goes on so what really should be seen as an ecological asset is still viewed as this problem that needs to be fixed unfortunately and we should really be looking to conserve these sites, not just as fantastic wildlife places um, and this refuge for our rare and scarce species that are declining in the wider countryside, but also as these important stepping stones in the landscape, so allowing species to move to the landscape, which is really important when it comes to climate change, which is going to force species to, to move. Um, and they also help to fill this gap. So a lot of our natural habitats would be much more fragmented if it wasn't for these colliery sites as well. So they're helping to sustain populations by allowing them to, to move through the landscape. So they, their importance goes beyond um, the invertebrates and the, the other biodiversity as well. But they also have this geological importance because they're as access points for uh, fossils and minerals. They also have some archaeological importance. They also have really important social importance, in my opinion, um, at urban green spaces. You get those physical and mental health benefits to local communities. Um, but perhaps most importantly, beyond the biodiversity, they have this cultural and historical importance. So the, in my opinion, they're part of our cultural identity um, as South Wales, as they would be to people in Yorkshire, for instance, and so forth. And I think they really should be conserved um, for, for those cultural links as well. So just to summarize, um, colliery spoil is a regional resource uh, that needs conservation and further investigation. And in my opinion, these are sites of high biodiversity significance and they really deserve to be protected. So hopefully that's kind of given you a bit of a brief overview as to why these sites are, are so important, even though I haven't been able to delve into a lot of the rather quite weird and wacky species that you find on these sites. But if you want any more information, then uh, you can feel free to ask me during this or check out my website as well. Thank you, Liam. That was um, really fascinating. That's fantastic. Um, we, we are going to have a little bit of time for questions uh, a bit later on. So if any questions for, the, for Liam, please hold on to them now. But the details of his website are in the chat, as I said before. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, Michael, Michael Malay, who's going to tease out some of these ideas uh, that, that Liam has has raised about the, the specialness of these sites and um, and reflect reflect a bit on that for us. So um, please welcome Michael. Thank you, Jessica. I'm just going to try sharing my screen first. Can you see that? Okay, Jessica. Liam? Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to read out um, a small piece of writing I've been working on over the summer, and it's really um, a response to uh, some of the things that, that Liam showed me last year when he gave me a tour of the Coon Coking Works um, and, and these, these coal spoils. Um, and after that trip uh, to South Wales with, with Liam, I started seeing my own uh, local acres in a, in a very different way. Uh, and so the second part of um, what I'll be reading out is about Bristol and, and coming back to Bristol with, with a new um, appreciation for places I, I maybe um, overlooked or, or neglected. We hear the gorse before we see it. Dozens of seed pods cracking in the sun, a dry snapping in summer heat. At first, I think it's an electric fence filling the air with its pulse. But then Liam points to some bushes and I begin to understand. The chatter was coarse. The heat was cracking open the land. The end of July, 2019, one of the hottest days of the year. The skeleton of the Coombe Coking Works sits in the valley below us. Two towers surrounded by an assembly of gantries, coal bunkers, conveyor belts, rusting pipes and circular tanks. The buildings have been decaying for decades the structures prized open by wind and rain, and now trees are beginning to grow from the roots, roots clutching steel and concrete. A few miles away on the ridge of the next valley, we can see a scattering of wind turbines, 
the blades moving slowly on this day of little wind. Crick, crick, the gorse pods continue to split, tumbling small seeds into light. But beneath the crackling of the gorse is a more persistent sound, full of urgency and itching and need. I ask Liam if he knows what it is, and he tells me it's a grasshopper, although what species it is, he isn't sure. We kneel down and listen for its call. The grass is dry and brittle, and as we push back the stalks, they make the sound of rain sticks being gently turned. Although perhaps rain sticks is too wet an image, for the summer this year has been unrelenting. The soil is chalky and dry, and for weeks the sun has been taking the sound of water away from the earth. In mid-July, a section of the River Stour on the border of Essex and Suffolk simply evaporated, while the chalk streams of South England, the Darent, the Lee, the Wandle, the Vare, ran perilously low. We flatten the grass with our hands and peer down. Here on this hill overlooking the coping works, the grasshoppers were answering the sun's dryness with vibrant clicks and chirps, a high-pitched earth music. After a little more searching, we finally find it, a small creature clinging to the base of the stem, crisp green wings, exaggerated legs, and an impassive rigid mask like the expression of a geisha. It tenses at our approach. It is small and pitiful and very beautiful. It launches into sky and leaves behind a trembling stalk. How did the grasshopper come to be there? And not only the grasshopper, but the other insects Liam pointed out that day, the hoverflies and moths, the ants and dragonflies, the beetles and parasitic wasps. It's a story of ruin as much as it is of creation. In their search for coal, the miners pulled up all manner of things, including limestone, mudstone, ironstone, and claystone. The materials were piled up in the most haphazard ways, first in little hillocks, and then, as the mining continued, into landscape-defining hills. Sometimes these tips would spontaneously ignite and smolder for days. One of the minerals embedded in coal is pyrite, and after being ex exposed to oxygen and rain, the pyrite on the coal tips would catch fire and send noxious fumes into the sky, a truly hellish sight. Occasionally, the fires would fuse together different waste materials, producing a weird industrial cake. These are places where time and matter were pulled out of joint and dumped on the spoils. And we continue to live with this out of jointedness today, not only as a physical presence in the landscape, but in the unsteady weather of our times, which is partly the weather of our own making. Yet the insects go on. Because the spoils were composed of different materials with different pH levels and soil structures, they provided the underlying substrate for different landscapes to emerge. Which is why if you walk through the coal spoils today, you will find bilberry filled heaths next to vetch covered meadows or patches of bare free draining ground next to bristling reed beds where electric blue dragonflies move quickly above marshy water. The randomness was everything. It was randomness that led to mossy places thriving next to thistly fields and to purple orchids growing in the same landscapes as gorse and heather. The miners had transformed the earth and now the natural world was transforming what remained. Today, the spoils continue to be seen as wastelands or brownfield sites, as Liam has been telling us. In truth, they are the abundant places we did not know we were looking for. Not long after my meeting with Liam, I began to spend more time on Troopers Hill, a nature reserve half a mile from where I live in East Bristol. I had noticed certain plants on the reserve before, the ling and bell heather, the clusters of gorse, the broom. It was only after that trip to the, to, to the coal spoils that the penny dropped. These plants were only here because humans had been here. If you had stood on this hill 200 years ago, you would have been standing on the site of a stone quarry and a copper smelting industry. At the height of the smelting, the nearby River Avon would have been full of barges carrying zinc ore from the Mendips, as well as copper, copper ore mined in Devon and Cornwall. The copper and zinc was transformed into brass on Troopers Hill, 
when the brass became an important currency in the transatlantic slave trade, with merchants trading pots, pans, kettles, rods, and manilas for enslaved peoples in West Africa. And the reason the brass was produced here was because the coal was here. Had you stood on Troopers Hill 300 million years ago, you would have been in a tropical swamp surrounded by giant horsetails, tree ferns, club mosses, and tall woody plants. You would also have been standing near the equator when the British Isles were part of Pangaea. Many eons later, after the British landmass drifted away from the equator, and after the swamps and trees fossilized with time, humans began to sink pits into the ground and to enter them with tallow candles affixed to their hats. Others followed them over the decades, and the more the workers went down, the more the city of Bristol grew up around them. If you go to Troopers Hill today, you can see, you can still see the coal-fired chimney that smelted copper here in the 18th and 19th centuries. People often stand at the chimney's base, touching the stone construction with open palms. Because of all this human activity, from the mining of coal to the quarrying of stone to the smelting of copper, the soil on Troopers Hill has lost its original character, has become thin and acidic. And it's because of this altered profile that is able to host plants that grow nowhere else in Bristol, including heath bed straw, sheep sorrel, and mouse ear hawkweed. And with the plants have come the creatures. In 2006, an ecologist found 276 invertebrate species on Troopers Hill, which is a surprising amount for such a small uh, nature reserve of, of about 15 to 20 acres. My friend reminds me that the word spoil has two meanings. It can refer to the devastation left behind when something has been damaged, but it can also mean treasure, as when we speak about the spoils of our plunder. That doubleness runs deep in the coal fields of South Wales, but it also applies to Troopers Hill and to so many of the places that we've mishandled. Without any of our interference and without any of our planning, some of the landscapes we call wastelands have become difficult paradises. These are places where life is learning to thrive again, but they are difficult because they do not conform to our ideas of health. If you walk up Troopers Hill from the river, if you walk up to Troopers Hill from the river, you are confronted with a giant sandstone face and a ripple of colors that move from grayish blue to red. Some angles are sharp and prismatic, while others have been rounded off by wind and rain, and the angles catch the light in different ways. In late summer, heather adds mauve to the mix, the broom adds a flush of dark green, and yellow cl clusters of goldenrod run along the bottom slopes a kind of living pontalism. You realize that you are looking at something that industry has defaced, but you are also looking at something beautiful. And it is because of that damage to Troopers Hill that it is a nature reserve today. The place has been severely undermined. And so it flourishes in Bristol's former industrial heartlands. I liked the chimney on Troopers Hill. It made you feel small in the most expansive way. I would go there in the afternoons after working on a nearby allotment I shared with some friends. And during those afternoons, sitting with a beer as the sun set over Bristol, I began to notice the songs of grasshoppers and crickets. It was good to hear them. Their calls were little happenings in the field, small exclamations and earth hymns. And when many of them sang together, as they did on warm summer evenings, it was like hearing the grass speak. The calls of grasshoppers and crickets are equally distinctive, from the high-pitched crystal tinkling of the great green bush cricket to the dry rattle of the meadow grasshopper. But on those late afternoons and early evenings on Troopers Hill, it was the songs of crickets that moved me the most. Grasshoppers sing of diurnal things and noonday heat, but cricket song is the music of late lights and summer evenings. Many of them begin calling at dusk, that time when the mind seems to move in a different medium, and when, by imperceptible degrees, feelings stored deep within the body begin to emerge to the surface of things. A floating witchery of sound, Coleridge says, of the Aeolian harp, and cricket song was like that too. When their nocturnes began, the bats of Troopers Hill would swim into the sky, 
joining the Swifts in their Vespers flights. Later, when the Swifts clocked off for the night, the only sounds left were the winds against the grass and the stridulations of the crickets, whose music seemed to emerge from the earth and then hover a few feet above the ground. At times it felt as though the crickets were part of the earth's sensing membrane, part of its feeling skin. And on blustery nights, the wind would scatter their calls across the hills. And then the place would be full of sound as if the air itself were shaking with speech. It was good to sit inside that music. They were the sounds of the land thinking and turning over a question in its mind. And after weeks of such listening, their calls would begin to pulse in your body, even when they were not there. Returning from Trooper's Hill at night, I would find that the place had followed me home, there in the grass stalks that clung to my socks, and in the faint synaptic whirring in my brain, the sound of crickets in my ears as I lay in bed. Their songs were like the accumulated latencies of the earth, rising up from the exhausted soil, saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm still here. Leanne, thank you so much. That really became a floating witchery of, of sound. Um, I think we've just been given a preview of something very special that's, that's going to be published uh, in the years to come. Um, and how extraordinary to be shown these abundant places we didn't know we needed, we didn't know we were making. And that was really special. Thank you, Michael. Um, I've now got the pleasure of introducing um, Tim D. Perhaps he's going to appear on his screen. Um, hello, Tim. Uh, <laughs> he is, this is really, before you hear this man here, is really one of the most transformatively observant and magically articulate uh, writers around in any genre. Um, his most recent book, Greenery, came out just back in March. Um, and just glowed with renewal in that strange, lonely spring. And it is a book about spring, uh, Tim following the passage of the season through the world. It's his favorite season. He just wanted to live in it all year. So he followed it through the world in the company uh, of some of the birds he most loves to think and, and feel with. Uh, it works like some sort of literary astrolabe correlating points on the globe. Um, I urge you to read it in any season, every season, uh, because it's so much about seeds of life springing up in bare and unpromising places uh, and about the vast momentum by which nature somehow keeps going. Um, Tim is first and foremost uh, a bird watcher and bird writer. Uh, he says, if I know how life goes, it is as much as anything because of sandpipers and swallows. Thanks to them, I've heard the roaring of the world. Well, if we think back to the DVAT catalogue, there are some unmissable works, which I shall just take a moment uh, to show you. There's uh, The Running Sky and Four Fields, um, which moves uh, between a home patch of Fenland and further fields uh, in Zambia and Montana and Chernobyl, um, all of them catching the roar of the world. But the reason I thought of Tim straight away when I read Liam, um, Liam's piece and Michael's piece um, was because of his book, Landfill, um, one of the most counterintuitive, unpromising of titles. Uh, my neighbour just said, you're not going to be talking about landfill. But yes, we are. That's the point. Um, uh, Tim, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Cape Town, where you are much missed by some people over here, including me. Um, can we start with this landfill? Yeah. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to talk a bit and we're going to sort of really concentrate on your work and then I'm hoping that you'll be happy to sort of respond to the specifically to the collieries a bit and to the ideas just raised so so let's have a think about you for goodness sake what drew you to the rubbish dumps and are you really going to suggest that we take nature walks at the local tip yeah, well yeah I mean as, 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 as both Michael and Liam have said they, these are these are extraordinary places rich rich places uh, and uh, what drew me was actually discovering that a lot of my 
serious, really serious bird watching friends, and I'm not really a that serious a bird watcher by comparison with lots of the people I know, uh, were, in, were spending time in these, in these ghastly shitty places um, because that, that was where the birds were. If you live in the city uh, and you want to go bird watching uh, and you're serious about wanting to know what's going on in, your, in the avian life of the city, uh, a rubbish dump or a waste recycling unit on the way to a rubbish dump. Uh, and I began to learn all of the taxonomies of rubbish as I studied this book and put it together. Um, uh, there's a waste transfer station, I think they're called actually, um, big, big, uh, places you end up going to. I mean, I grew up as a bird watcher in, in a city in, living in South London, and I used to go automatically to sewage farms and to reservoirs and to man-made places. That's where in the, in the urban environment, birds were. Um, there wasn't any wild habitat. I mean, the city parks of South London were pretty non-existent in terms of uh, their biodiversity. Um, so it was always, I understood that um, as a bird man, bird boy and then a bird man, that um, there wasn't really a hierarchy of, of purity re regarding where nature occurred. Uh, in terms of, you know, the wilderness. I mean, I, of course, we all dreamt of the Serengeti or of, or of, of the, the Northeastern American um, redwoods uh, or whatever it would be, the Himalayas. Um, but we knew uh, that, that really what there was was Beddington Lane Sewage Farm and Chew Valley Lake and, um, and Thurrock. And, uh, and and Pitsy landfill site, as it turned out, in on the on the Essex shore of the Essex, of the of the Thames estuary, and they're extraordinary magnets. I mean, as as Liam has, has so beautifully described, and as Hayden is so, uh, uh, sorry, as um, Michael is so articulately and intelligently, you know, extrapolated. Um, they they these are these are these are these are dense with. Um, I mean, they're wonderful correctives to our, our prevailing assumption that actually the things that we've done have been to make a mess. I mean, we have made a mess and we have wrecked and we've fracked and worse than fracked, uh, you know, done in and done over the, 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 the landscape, the, what, the wild nature. But it turns out that actually in the spoils and in the, in the ruins and in the mess and in the gaps between, uh, is is all sorts of uh, opportunities for nature, and nature, uh, you know, goes in and uh, has, has has done its stuff. And so I, I, I needed to know why my bird watching friends were going to spend time on rubbish dumps, and I needed to know why they were also spending time, particularly, watching gulls, which I'd grown up thinking of as being a slightly trash bird, a commonplace bird that you didn't really spend much time with because they were sort of there was a kind of vulgarity about them I mean, the, the, and, uh, in, the, in, the, in their journey towards us. And I knew they weren't seagulls. That was one of the, one of the first things you learnt as a, as a young bird man. Um, but I knew also that they, they were, they'd started on a journey uh, towards, the, the, towards the Anthropocene before we'd identified the Anthropocene as such, you know, in a way, uh, they, they were making accommodation. And it wasn't a surrendered accommodation uh, with with the, the stuff that uh, the conditions of life that we were laying down. It was actually an opportunistic and an entrepreneurial and um, uh, immigrant uh, success story, as far as the girls were concerned. So that's that was the motor and that was the engine. Mm. You, you give a lot of time to watching the watchers, you know, you're gripped by the other people at the, the dump, the, uh, the gold champion uh, ringers, etc. Um, can you tell me a bit about how you and how they are experiencing those places? I mean, this is, I, I understand that the birds there are, you know, are gripping and um, and and they're studying the birds but does that make the whole experience of the place in some way beautiful is beautiful a kind of irrelevant word here do we need another kind of word can you say something about the spirit of place in a in a rubbish dump i, I wanted to ask, i mean that's that were, those are the sorts of questions i wanted to ask them you know what do they think we about being in being in the place that they were in spending every weekend of their winter um assembling in a rubbish dump in on the north shore of the river thames uh 
they don't would would never put it in in the ter in terms of well not, not it's not fair to say never but um most of them wouldn't would put it in terms of, of beauty or of um you know or, or understanding that they were somehow taking part in a in a strangely sort of transgressive um experience meeting meeting seeking a kind of uh, redemption from from filth uh, in, in, by by spending time studying these these birds uh, in the in the in the place where the birds gather. I mean, they're more interested. Uh, most of those people in in in, in that Essex rubbish dump that I write a lot about in in landfill were were ringers. Above all, they wanted to put rings on the birds' legs in order to find out where they were going and where they'd come from and where they were returning to, how they were living, how they were making it work. I mean, they were they were so there was there was a there was an aggregate of birds on this aggregate of filth uh, that was that was good news for them and they launched amazing cannon nets over over the over the ground and and, and ran after the birds once the net had fallen and captured them and we ringed in in a day hundreds of birds and it's extraordinary experience to to, to witness men mostly men it has to be said not entirely but mostly men handling these birds, getting these great big birds out of uh, from under a net, uh, putting them in a, in a sack, taking them to a ringing station, uh, which is, turns out to be the back of a Land Rover that is a car that's kept entirely and solely on that dump, can never be allowed to go anywhere else, uh, and then putting a ring on its on its leg and, and documenting it and a colour ring as well. Um, it's a sort of form of close magic you know to see someone ha ha handling a bird like that and they, they 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 don't put it they would never say it like that of course they're interested they're amateurs but they're interested in 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 the, in the growing knowledge and they also in some ways they have to love the gull i mean the, the larophile they wouldn't declare themselves to be a gull lover uh, but they are often if asked about it would say these birds are maligned elsewhere you know these birds are not um, are not loved. I mean, they're every every summer season within Britain in the last fifteen years, there's been a kind of open warfare on gulls as they've been. Mm -hmm. Stories have come into the press about them stealing chips and chihuahuas, and you know an expert is found who says this, the gulls. The next thing they'll take will be a human baby, and all that. And these gents on the rubbish dump. Um, and know that that's not the case, uh, and they they and they know how to ha how hold this extraordinarily huge, uh, aggressive and, and confident bird in within their hands and pass it through the, their hands in, in like like someone dealing a beautiful deck of cards. Um, uh, so they're they, I mean that's me of course uh, taking my own romantic sensibility towards those people, but it's. Um, it, there's something else there, I think, and it's the same actually. I when I went and, and you described in Four Fields, I wrote a chapter about Chernobyl, and I went with a with a man who's worked on the swallows in Chernobyl for a long time. Oh, he was clamoring to get there almost as soon as the explosion happened in 1986, and he now goes on his summer holidays when he's not in Chernobyl to Fukushima to do the same sort of work. Uh, there's a kind of testing in these hot places that that certain people are attracted to and i was interested in why that should be mm. for the girl as well as for the swallows of chernobyl i mean you mentioned a sort of romanticizing sensibility and i i i want to ask about i suppose literary influences and what you think literature can do in helping us become uh, more attentive to a great variety of forms of in, environment and and place. And you, when you very early in the book, you quote the Great Gatsby, you quote um, uh, the Valley of the Ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat. And I suppose I have always understood that as a, a sort of black and white inverse to a sort of pastoral golden wheat field. But actually, you're going back at modernism in a sense and saying no, there were you know there was extraordinary fertility there in the in the valley of the ashes perhaps how can you say a bit about what you the literary influences that came in on the book well actually landfill turned out to be quite a literary book in some mm. ways I, I wanted to counterpoint the the kind of um uh, feculent substrate <laughs> that i was walking over and working through um 
with with other with with the with the work of others who've been drawn to that. I mean, you know, in some ways, it's it's simply an ex an expansion of those that wonderful uh, little short passage by Rambo about the things he's attracted to, kind of theatre rubbishy bits of ephemera, bits of um, um, theatre playbills, um, pub signs, those sorts of things. It's it's the sort of accidental, arbitrary, marginal languages um, that are um, give a kind of rich uh, circus of, to, 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 to the modern imagination uh, and which modernism has been interested in. I mean, the, the, the not the, the, you know, folk art uh, and the uh, urban un, 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 unloved um, uh, bits of, 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 of writing and of, of, of the trans the making of paper waste and rubbish and the recycling of those sorts of bits of um, Disposable stuff that seems to be so strong in in uh, in in the in the in the, in the, in the kind of collagist impulses of um, of the 20th century you know, creativity in all sorts of ways, you know that you wanted to go with. Uh, I was just looking again today, even at, at Ezra Pound writing in the, in the, from his cage in the in the uh, in, in the Pisan cantos. Um, Making making something out of his out of his out of his rubbishy view. Uh, it turns out there were swallows on the wires of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the telephone telegraph wires that were, were above the above the, 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 the internment camp he was in in Pisa, uh, and he transcribed the swallows on the wires uh, as a musical. He saw that as a musical stave uh, and, um, and, and and annotated where the swallows were on the wires. And I suppose, in some ways, not seeking to be as grand as that, but uh, or, or as or as, as 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 original as that, but um, I mean, I, in I I've I've been interested in the way in which accidentally uh, nature and modernity have bumped into one another and have been observed. I mean, not always necessarily best observed by bird watchers. Quite the opposite. I mean, there's, Philip Larkin wrote a poem about uh, gulls winging their way to the way, winging their way to the corporation rubbish term in 1962. You know, he was on the case for landfill in 1962. One mm. then um, uh, it took me a longer time to get going. Um, uh, so, and of course, there's Beckett and rubbish dumps, but there's also uh, Stig of the dump, and there's the seagull. Uh, and, and 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 which has got and Chekhov Seagull, which has got marvelous things about rubbish and gulls and and the accidental associations of the two. I think that it turns out when you look at the at the biology um, that gulls in in modernity, if that if we allow the 20th century to be modernity, uh, have, have been associated with broken and fractured places and and encountered by people who were going through a similar breaking and fracturing in, in, in their arrivals into the, into the city. And there's an amazingly revelatory discovery for me in, 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 in a book about the Birds of London by W.H. Hudson that describes the first attention that was paid to gulls coming up the River Thames in London. In the, in the 19th century, there were no gulls in London. People were doing the work of gulls. Uh, they, they were the rag pickers and the, and the, and the waste sorters. In the, in the early 20th century, it, things changed and people began to pay attention to gulls coming because they felt the need of the gulls. They were birds that were, that were coming in for succor uh, in, in hard weather and difficult times. And Hudson, amazingly, himself an immigrant from Argentina, uh, wrote about uh, how young apprentice boys went to the banks of the River Thames and, and shared their lunch boxes with the gulls that were, that were in the in the winter time when there was ice on the river and so on at the same time other people were were describing those gulls as beggars as gypsies as 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 um unwanted creatures from elsewhere i mean so the, the memes of of um of, of of reaction towards the birds you know uh, uh, along being sown and um and it's the same in, in literature. I mean, literature, non, I mean, non, non fiction, fiction, fictional literature, creative writing has, has, has wanted to do the same. Daphne du Maurier's The Birds is a book about gulls as, as malign uh, agents of the, of the communist world, it seems to me. 
um, it's a Cold War text, uh, not not the film that Hitchcock made of the of the, of the story. But uh, so there, there's an extraordinary amount of penetration into into cultural life of these things, mostly unobserved by most people. But if you begin to pick it out and put it together, then there's a heap of stuff, a landfill itself of, of attention that's been paid to these birds, accidentally or otherwise. It's forming in my mind now. In fact, I'm quite wanting to teach a whole module on waste and, and literature. Um, can we, just as a last question, Tim, and I, and I might ask this same question to Michael as well. Thinking about you as a, as a writer and your very processes of, of writing and, and as a stylist, are you aware of trying to make a, a sort of new aesthetics of mess somehow? Your books are very, very structurally organised, but they allow mess within that overarching structure. And I wonder if you're sort of thinking line by line about how you can make diverse things meet and merge and sit together through metaphor and, and so on and list. Can you say a bit about that? That's a lovely question. Um, I hope so. I mean, I am chaotically messy. <laughs> you can't see any mess in the picture at the moment. I'm living on, on um, emergency measures under my wife's terms, uh, and she's the opposite of me. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, the, uh, this is, I'll, I'll ask, answer this in a sort of, in, in an accidentally circumlocutious way. Um, I mean, one thing I love about birds, and I've said this before and I've written it before, is that they don't carry any bags. They don't, they're not mess makers, if you like. They don't bring clutter with them. And it's an amazing story to be able to think of swallows flying from where I am now in the southern tip of Southern Africa to the north of Finland and Norway without a passport, but also without a carrier bag or a suitcase. Those awful crenellated trundles that you hear as when as we wheel our little suitcases through the uh, shopping centers and through the uh, airports and departure lounges. Um, birds don't have to do that. Uh, and um, so I meet in, in if to be uh, grand about it or poetic about it, and in some ways I meet that purity, that uncluttered life, moving life of nature, crucially moving for me, with a, with a kind of uh, a noise of uh, a, a mess of, of, of language, I suppose. Um, and that's, you know, the, what, what, so it's birds and words. I mean, the words don't mean anything to the birds. And that's rather beautiful and helps them and allows me to write what I will about them, uh, but I know that they're safe from them. They don't have to be, you know, bag, bag down with them, bogged down with them, you know, cluttered with them. I did see when I was writing Landfill, um, actually a gull with a <laughs> carrier bag stuck to its foot. And I thought this was an absolute totem of, 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 of my story. You know, what I was doing was sticking these bloody carrier bags full of rubbish on the bottoms of these poor gulls and making them fly out the River Thames. Uh, it did manage to shake it off, in fact, so I didn't feel so bad in the end. But um, so it's that mixture of, of uh, the necessary mess that is our engagement with the, 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 the kind of cleanness, if you like, of the of the of the other. I, if, if, if if that doesn't that sound. That was a very beautiful. Okay, mess of a beautiful, beautifully structured answer. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, I at some point want to, in my life, want to ask you about indexes because you won't let us just access part of your books from an in, an index. There's not that sense of the quick, the quick reference, the organisation in in that sense. But perhaps we won't talk about that now. Maybe I can ask Michael whether. Hello, Michael. I just wonder if you might want to say something in response to this conversation about writing order and mess? Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question. I, I should probably start by saying I'm very much an apprentice writer. I'm, um, I see myself mostly as a teacher. Um, so I'm learning a lot as I go along. When I, when I went to the coal fields last year with, with Liam, I had no way of, of grasping 
the diversity and heterogeneity of, of what I saw. You know, uh, Liam at one point showed me uh, a tufa spring, and Liam could probably say better than I what a tufa spring is, but it's it's a cal calcareous formation that occurs when calcium has been brought up from, from the earth. Um, and then water finds um, um, finds a kind of outing. Um, and so you get these sort of rich calcium filtered water that then calcifies on the surface of, of the land. And it produces these really wonderfully soft calcium beds. And then there are special soldier flies that then live off of that uh, tufa. And then about five meters away, we saw a wildflower meadow. Um, and then around the corner from the wildflower meadow, we, we saw this amazing reed bed, which I believe is, is the largest reed bed in, in the south of Wales. And, and Liam, you have to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. And how do you begin to um, put your arms around that? Um, it, it felt messy and conceptually disorganized. And, but that, that, that's what was there. Um, and I was fascinated by the, the fact that these landscapes were sitting next to, you know, cheek by jowl and, um, and in normal circumstances, you would need to walk for half a day before you, you know, go from an inland sand dune to a place of free draining ground to a place of, of birch woodland. Um, I have to say that this was the toughest chapter I've, I've had to write. Um, because precisely of, of the, the messiness of the landscape and trying to find a kind of framework that might organize all these landscapes. Um, and I don't think there is a framework. I think it's just a case of accepting the messiness of it. It, it feels like a surrealist painting or, or a surrealist kaleidoscope walking into, into the coal fields um, um, or, or some kind of modernist collage you know, uh, artwork. Um, none of it makes sense, and yet it's very beautiful and, and interesting and, and, and rich. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can probably hear my response, I haven't figured out a way of, of, of writing about it. Um, but maybe coherence isn't, isn't the point here. Uh, maybe uh, embracing the incoherence and, and the messiness of it is, is okay. Mm. Is there anything you'd like to ask him about his ways of writing it? <laughs> Oh, I have so many questions. In fact, I probably have a few of Tim's books um, behind me on, on the shelf here. Um, I mean, I, I have been reading Greenery recently and um, I started reading it in the spring and I haven't finished it yet. Not because it's not a good book, um, Tim, but because I find it so unbelievably rich so I can only take a few pages at a time and then I have to put it away and let it rest for a week. And I guess I was just interested in asking Tim, um, um, something about the, the metaphor, um, your way of connecting the world through metaphor um, is really what I, I noticed most in, in that book. And um, we're reading The Peregrine this year, this, week for, for one of my classes. And um, we've come, you know, we've come across this chestnut that um, accurate seeing has nothing to do with with pretty metaphor or, or poeticizing. And we've been thinking about the way Baker actually gets to a truth through decorative language or through elaborate language or through through metaphor. And I, I'd like to ask you about, yeah, um, where does metaphor sit in your in your writing and thinking? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a lovely question again. Um, I I think for me it's it, it's it's everything as you as you say. I mean, I mean, I I don't I'm not a scientist. I'm not Liam. I'm, I, I can't identify the butterflies properly or the or the coleoptera or the or the or the millipedes, let alone. Um, I love people who. Do that, and I love the texts that, that, that pr provide me with the information, such that I, I, you know, begin to know the list of millipedes that might be occurring in a South Walian uh, spoil heap. Uh, and I think there's a poetry in 
that and a kind of non-metaphorical poetry in 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 simply in the in the in the in the inventory and in the naming of of what is there. Um, I'm also not a poet, uh, so I don't I don't work in in the absolute internalizing, of, if that's what poets do, of of, of experience and that, and it's and it's re-exporting it onto onto the page. So somewhere between those two uh, writers, if you like, if we can call them that, uh, is is where I where I go with it with the nature stuff. Um, and I think uh, it is it is it is metaphorical mostly because I but but I my my justification for that in some ways would be that I or my the strictures that I impose upon myself for that is that I is that I take I always I re I attempt to re-export my my metaphorical uh, impressing of of nature uh, back onto the thing itself. I mean I test it every time you know and sometimes that they're quite fanciful and quite far-fetched uh literally far-fetched got from over the horizon of um of of of, of sensibleness of possibility of legitimacy um but but before a reader has had a chance to say this is too much i hope i i i i've been i've i've taken that metaphorical formulation if you like and, and and reapplied it to the animal or the bird or the the landscape or whatever the weather system whatever it would be and i've tried to feel that it's it's okay i mean i've sort of given i i sort of give it back to the thing before i publish it if that's if that make i mean that sounds ludicrous doesn't it because they don't have an answer to me except about so i'm testing my own i'm testing my own extravagance if you like um uh, you know back at back on back onto the scene uh or the, the, the the creature or, or the or the place and um uh, but i love also the way in which we we as a species are that's how we engage with the, the not the non us the the other i mean we we don't we don't know what it is like to be a bat um <laughs> Uh, because we we're not a bat, uh, we all we know is 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 the metaphorical reach towards our thinking uh, within our thinking that, that that can that can take us towards the idea of us thinking about what it is like to be a bat. Um, that, that, that 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 that's where our the texture and the rub of of, of our engagement with the world lies. I mean, it's um, it's we are um, we think with animals, but we're not animals that are thinking in that way uh, i mean we are um we're language users we, we are effectively describing our estrangement and our separation from the any from from the rest of nature um at the same time as we're describing it if you see what i mean that's so that's where the metaphor comes in if that's not i mean again that sounds i'd sooner talk about insects on a coal heap because uh, <laughs> that's where I feel that the real truth lies that, that everything else is just commentary in a way uh, but um, I, that's all I've got I, I, I'm, a, I'm a commentator in, in that way. I think we should open out to some questions from hopefully some students or other people out there um, just for 10 minutes up to to 7.15. If you've got a question, could you unmute yourself and shout it out? And if lots of people shout at once, I will try and separate any squabbles. I was um, wondering whether the same process was at work with um, uh, disused slate quarries in Wales. Yeah, that's quite a good question, actually. I don't think much work has been done on slate, but I don't, I don't imagine it would be quite so valuable um, because generally the the actual slate pieces itself actually completely cover the ground. So they almost don't give an opportunity for the plant species to, to kind of get through, and then you get the the animal species as a result. But we certainly know that things like copper and tin mines are really important um, down in Cornwall, for instance, for invertebrates and other wildlife. 
Um, we also know that, well, I've done a little bit of work on landfill actually myself, uh, looking at invertebrates and found them to be pretty good as well. Um, and copper, copper mines, yeah, copper, tin mines, lots of other heavy metal sites can be really good for invertebrates. But yeah, I don't think enough work has really been done on slate, but from what I superficially see looking at it, I don't think it, they would be quite so valuable. A lot of them do flood, so I suppose that provides um, a different sort of habitat, doesn't it? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but yeah, with a lot of these sites, they because they're not particularly um, considered a value, really. Very little research has gone into them, so there's still a lot of unknowns, really, when it comes to these these brownfield sites, unfortunately. Can I ask a question? Oh, please do. Um, uh, I've been thinking, of, uh, well, how do I start this? I've been thinking about um, this thing that John R Ruskin used to do where he, like, he'd like sketch a place and by sketching the place, it would force him into a deeper engagement with that place. And he encouraged other people to do similar things. And then, um, and, and and not not to get good at sketching, but rather the rather to become happier and to appreciate where you are, and where you live. And I guess that this idea of um, diving into these places that most people would consider, you know, uh, not worth thinking about or whatever, and by and by really considering them and seeing their value and seeing their, um, you know that that for it it makes you appreciate where you live more i i assume and makes you happier to be where you are and and, and what's around you so i was thinking have you got any advice for people that would like to engage deeper with their surroundings uh, how they might how they might do that and how they might um, become happier where they, with where they are. I guess that question may, maybe goes to Michael, possibly. Gosh, Sam, that's a really good question. It's a, it's a big question. Um, I, I was thinking of a, a John Berger essay on drawing when you first spoke about sketching. And he has a lovely li line where he says that Every time you look, you're asking a question of reality and testing your apprehension against the thing that you see, which in turn should shape the line that you're drawing on, on your sketch pad. And I, I love that idea of a continual conversation between hand, eye, and landscape. And it should be this richly um, reciprocal relationship where the hand is drawing what the eye sees, but the eye is being in a sense, shaped by, by what it's receiving. Um, but the, the question of being content with where you are, it depends on where you are, doesn't it? And what your circumstances are. And um, um, just on a very personal note, I, I grew up in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I grew up in a middle-class family, but um, about half a mile away from us was a dump. And um, the people working on the dump were children my age, about seven, eight years old. And they made a living by finding Coke bottles and pulling that out of the dump. So I don't want to just say in a kind of glib way that just paying attention does the trick and being immersed in wherever you are is enough to, um, um, to make you feel at one or, or anyway, not fragmented, because I, I think it depends very much on class dynamics, on, on, on one's position, I guess you'd say. Um, but, you know, Troopers Hill, this place I talked about, I, I've walked there and I've ignored it for so long. Um, I've, I spent a long, you know, a lot of time there with, with friends and um, drinking beer on the hill or playing guitar, but not really noticing it. And it was really thanks to th that trip with Liam that I, I began to care about, oh, how, how did this place come into being? Why is there Heather here when it's not growing anywhere else in St. George in, in East Bristol where I live? And I guess what that trip to South Wales did was rearrange the invisible hierarchy I carry around in my mind 
which determines what's valuable and worth caring about and what I neglect or, or ignore. And it was really healthy and, and helpful for me to have those categories scrambled up in my mind uh, because then I suddenly, you know, I got in touch with my local acres um, and started to value them a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know if that helps to answer the question at all, Sam. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a very beautiful answer. Thank you. Terrific. I love the phrase local acres as well. <clears throat> Let's fit in one last question. And Ma who's, is it Martin? Was Martin waving first? Go on, Martin. Well, actually, I wasn't a question. I just wanted to respond to those really interesting observations because, um, and, and so I'll keep it short so somebody else can ask a question. But in my photographic project on the street I've been living on for the last 33 years, lockdown has made me perceive it in a quite different way. And what I've done is I've got a series of photographs in, in that uh, overall project called Looking at the Overlooked. And that's everything from looking at drain covers to uh, the nuts that are coming falling off the trees in the, in the autumn to um, why road signs are the direction they're in, what, what little posters and stickers people put up on, on the um, lampposts, and 101 other things that you can observe, which actually most of the time, a bit like your visit to Troopers Hill, um, they, they don't, um, they don't force themselves onto you. You have to look out for them, and when you've observed them, they suddenly become much more alive and much more part of your experience. And that's really all I want to say. But that that is part of that process. Thank you, Martin. And I've <clears throat> I've given people a, a link to your website in case they'd like to have a look at those photographs. Thank you. I think there was, was a, let's, sorry, one last question there. This is the last one. Was, was, did Paul have one? Hello, Paul, Cockburn, really nice to see you. Um, yeah, I do have a sort of vaguely formed question, if that's all right. Um, that was three very interesting talks. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's made me think a little bit about the relationship between aesthetic beauty and ecological health. And do you see the work that you do as paying attention to those um, landscapes in a way that allows you to appreciate the aesthetic beauty that might not have already been um, apparent? Or is it about developing a new model of what is beautiful? Or is it about like severing that link between um, traditional notions of what beautiful landscape is and ecological health, if that makes any sense? I couldn't have summed up the whole event any better than that. So I'm hoping that all three of our speakers might uh, do us the favor of just saying a few words in response to that completely brilliant question. Thank you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll go first then. Yeah, that was a great question, I was Paul. Um, yeah, I, I personally think we've got to change our attitudes to really to what we think of as being sort of wildlife rich places really. So I think a lot of people, when, when you ask the general public what they think of uh, somewhere rich in wildlife, I've, I expect the vast majority would say either wildflower meadow or they would say woodland, um, probably ancient woodland. And I, and I think we got this term that's coined actually by conservation is called brownfield site, which really doesn't do the, the whole site any justice at all. Because when you think of a brownfield site over a greenfield site, greenfield is generally agricultural land and a brownfield site then is these fantastic places like the swell tips. And in fact, the brownfield sites are often orders of magnitude greater in terms of the species they support as well as the rarities and stuff than these greenfield sites. And I just think we need, as a public, we do need to change our attitudes towards man-made habitats really because they can often be as rich, if not richer, than a lot of um, natural habitats. I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but that, that's my view anyway. Mm -hmm. oh, definitely, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. I think we, we, might need a, we might need a whole special day on brownfield sites and, and reinventing their aesthetics. Thank you. Tim? Uh, it's a really good question, Paul. And, you know, we have areas of outstanding beauty, don't we? but not areas of outstanding ugliness. <laughs> and what would it be to expand our categories a little bit more so that 
we're not preserving what gives us pleasure and enhances our sense of, of the landscape or, um, but um, as Liam is doing, preserves biodiversity or preserves, um, that has a category of value that has nothing to do with human pleasure and, and the aesthetic categories that we've inherited often uncritically from, you know, from the Greeks and, and the Romans sort of, you know, I, I, there's this whole aesthetic tradition just bearing down on us, isn't there, that we just carry around that's in a sense configuring how we see the, the landscape. It's sort of a regime of perception to, to put it in a very poncy way that, that sort of um, shaping, shaping our, um, our sense of, of things. And maybe we need to value ugliness um, or have, have an aesthetic category that's able to capture the richness of, of these so-called brownfield sites. And I think as Liam is saying, brownfield sites is, that's not gonna inspire anyone, is it, that, that term. We need, we need a better set of, um, a better vocabulary. Another, another phrase, you know, is unimproved grassland. Have you come across unimproved grassland before? Um, you, you often find um, an amazing abundance of, of um, fauna on so-called unimproved grasslands. Um, but just the name doesn't really inspire much, much sort of respect or, or um, appreciation for these, for these places. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of it has to do with our grammar of, of place and rewriting some of the um, the roots of, of that grammar. And maybe starting with ugliness is, is one way of, of going about it. Uh, a couple of years ago, Tim put me onto a poem by uh, the American poet A.R. Ammons. It's called, it's called Garbage. And, it's, um, and somewhere in, the, in that poem, um, Ammons says, um, garbage is the spiritual poem of our time because that's, that's what we're surrounded by. Um, in other words, um, there's, there's another line I'm thinking of by George Oppen, the poet, who says, um, there are things that we live among and to know them is to know ourselves. So why not, not, why not come into a knowledge of what's around us? And if, even if it's ugly, try to come to some um, accommodation with that ugliness, because it's also, it's also our ugliness. It's, it's the stuff that we've disavowed or repressed. Um, so maybe, I don't know, I'm mixing up therapy and, and ecology here, but. Mary what, what... Douglas is coming into the room. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, Tim, perhaps a, a last thought. Thank you, just a briefly, I mean, I, the, the, the other two are much more smart than me, but um, uh, culture comes from the commonplace as far as I'm concerned. I mean, so that uh, it's hard to make a good culture out of endangerment and rarity and specialness. Um, I don't know any good poems really about nightingales that have been written in Britain since the nightingale has become uh, a species of bird perilously close to extinction. There have been plenty of kind of desperately sad songs and stories and told about its plight, but it's, uh, it hasn't, we hate poetry that has a palpable design upon us. I mean, we don't, I, that doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Uh, the emergency measures uh, don't, don't give a strong culture. So the, the, I mean, the wonderful thing about, about the, 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 a culture of ugliness, if you like, or a culture of the spoil heap, uh, or the potential for a culture of the spoil heap and a culture of ugliness would be that it was, that, that that's, that will endure, uh, that there'll be enough going on in those places that will make people and the animals in those places connect. Uh, they will become sufficiently ordinary, uh, or they already are, to be to be part of of of, of, of a common discourse, and that, that's the way into culture. And that, for me, is the way into which these things will 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 live. Uh, if we're writing and, and and singing and making films about extinction and and, and loss all the time. Uh, we don't really know where to go. Uh, we, we don't really know what, what I mean, we're, we're singing songs which are always going to be about 
the the absent or the missing, whether whether they're now absent or were about to become absent. Um, so, you know, pay attention therefore to the to what is what is around us still, uh, and if that includes that must include the species of animal that we think of as sort of surrendered somehow, broken, feral, mongrel, things that are coming towards us like my gulls on the rubbish dumps, uh, like, this, like, the, the, like the colonists of, of, the, of the wonderful spoil heaps of South Wales. Um, let us sing those songs um, and, and not feel that these are, these are, these are just uh, the, the kind of best that we can do in, in a depleted environment. Um, so therefore make them make it make it ordinary in some ways make mess ordinary and enough to to be operative in 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 the best possible ways don't tidy it up too much as well if you tidy it away uh, uh, literally then you lose the species that, that liam's talked about in south wales but if you tidied it away uh, metaphorically culturally uh, you 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 lose uh, the the whole um, substantive um, coexistence with 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 other species, um, and if you all you're singing your songs about are uh, birds that are no longer present or or or, or um, animals that are on the verge of extinction, then uh, we become a kind of uh, elegiac um, people. In terms of our relationships with other other bits of nature and other places and other landscapes that we we have made or not made, let's not be elegized. Let's not. Thank you very much, all three. How extraordinary that a few concluding comments all turned out to be sort of giant statements, manifestos for our time that I'm very glad we were recording because we might want to quote them for years to come. Um, I feel so lucky that you joined us tonight and unleashed, unleashed this um, abundant, glorious mess, uh, founded the scheme for areas of outstanding natural ugliness, um, set us all on the path to thinking really strongly about how culture shapes and directs our attention and how we can be aware of that and make new culture happen. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for all the great questions, to everyone for joining in. Um, we'll be back with some more Arts of Place in November. Um, and if you'd like to hear about that, uh, do join our mailing list. And good night, everyone. Thank you.